Jeff Neal now from the University of Bristol, who's going to talk about simulating low magnitude floods in global flood models. So over to you, Jeff. Hi, Mark. Thank you. Um, just let me share my screen. Has that come up okay for you, Mark? Yep, I can see that fine. Brilliant. Okay, well, um, uh, good evening, everyone who's in, in Europe at least. Um, and uh, thanks for having me give a talk today. Um, I'm going to talk about simulating low magnitude floods in our, in our global flood model, um, mainly because they're, or we found that they're the most difficult ones to, to, to simulate. So the, this is the kind of smaller floods that happen relatively regularly. Um, however, I mean, I, I could equally call this title kind of recent uh, uh, improvements to our global flood model. Um, because most of them are aimed at, at, at targeting these types of, of event. Um, so, uh, so, so that's what I'm going to cover. Um, first thing I'm going to do is, is explain um, why we think, uh, if I can get this to move on. First thing I'm going to do is explain why we think our, our global flood model um, over predicts smaller return periods or, or, or the evidence that we have behind that. And then um, talk, about, talk about some of the ways that we're looking to improve uh, our simulation of small return periods and the, the, the changes that we're making to our modeling setup. And then I'm just going to show you some uh, initial results demonstrating uh, this working uh, in, in the model at regional scale. Um, so um, as Mark's here introducing me, I thought I would use uh, his paper to, to highlight one of the reasons why um, I think it's important to look at uh, smaller magnitude floods. Um, so here's a paper that Mark wrote uh, back in 2016, and uh, this compares um, basically flood exposure estimates across the continent of Africa for a number of um, early uh, global flood models. Uh, many of these have changed and been improved since, but but at least back then, the, this was the these are the results that you got. Um, and one of the interesting things or, or something that really struck me about these models was how little sensitivity there was to return period in these fluvial hazard models. We're seeing um, uh, areas affected and indeed population exposure numbers um, that are quite similar between what we think of as a very small one in five year event and uh, the, you know, the most extreme events that these or return periods that these models are simulating. Um, so, so clearly there's a, there's a lack of sensitivity here um, to return period, or, or we suspect there is because the low return period estimates are, are far higher than, than what's happening in reality. Um, and so um, this got me thinking about why this is, um, but also more recently we've had examples of, of, of why these small return periods are really important. So I've been working um, with the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office here in the UK on uh, providing them with data about tropical cyclones. Uh, and we've responded to a number of these for them, uh, in particular Cyclone uh, Idai and Eloise in um, Mozambique. Um, uh, and for, for Idai, which is the first one we responded to, we gave them estimates of flood exposure um, and computed where we thought the most inundated locations were, were, would be. Um, and these turned out to be really useful um, in, in, in that we were, we were fairly successful at identifying the most exposed localities, um, which, which could then in, in, inform decision making. Um, I, it I was a really rare event, a very large flood. Um, and then later on, we repeated the exercise for, for Cyclone Eloise. This is a less intense cyclone, uh, still quite serious. And we were having forecasts um, for the return periods of around kind of one in five, kind of one in 10 kind of year return periods. And these are really tricky for our model to simulate. So here we see for the Limpopo River, um, the town of Chokwe. And this is our one in five year flood hazard layer for this town. Um, and it, it struggles to, to, to keep, uh, to stop the water flooding out on, onto the wider floodplain. And in fact, the Red Cross went to this site um, uh, because they were concerned about the flooding. There, there were various triggers upstream that suggested they should be concerned. Um, and flooding didn't quite occur, but it was uh, an event of this kind of magnitude. So, so we think the models have, diff have difficulty simulating these small events. Um, 
Again, you can see again for uh, Idai and Eloise, this time around the town of Boozy, which was very badly hit um, uh, by Idai in 2019. Uh, we see the difference between the, the essentially the observed um, this time from Sentinel-1 flooding for the uh, Eloise and, and Idai. And this is basically the difference in, in or at least the models think this is the difference between a one in five year and something like more of a one in 200, 250 year kind of size of event. So we see very substantial differences in the flood extents between these and very substantial differences in the exposures that are just not quite repeated in, in our original versions of our model. Now you can argue about why this might be. Um, uh, one of the one of the theories is that while well, we, you know, we don't include things like flood defenses and other things, but actually if we go um, to early versions of our um, global flood model applied in the US, then, then we see a similar story. So here now, um, a paper by Neil Quinn, this is an event set model now, so they're producing uh, a loss exceedance curve for, for the United States, and they're comparing that with observations um, from, from NOAA of, of actual observed losses. Um, and we see at the higher uh, return periods, you know, the low probability stuff, um, these data sets are kind of consistent, or at least the, the, the data sit within the spread of the model results that, that we get. Um, as you go down to the uh, more common events, uh, we see that the model has a bias towards overprediction. Um, some of this might be reporting uh, errors, so missing data from smaller floods. But actually also we think that, that there's some overprediction by this, this version of the model, this older version of the model. Um, and this model includes things like defenses and it's got a reasonably accurate hydrology to it. Um, so, so, we, so I thought I, I would go through some of the reasons why we think this occurs and, and, and some of the things that we're doing about that. Um, so again, further uh, examples here. Um, why do we get so much flooding at lower return periods? Well, well, two obvious reasons are, well, for, firstly, maybe the flows are too high or the event footprints are too big. So are there biases in these? Um, we don't think so from looking at, at the data that we have. Um, uh, however, it's you know, quite possibly the case, always improving your hydrology will improve uh, your flood model. Uh, another thing that we know to be a problem is missing flood defenses. Um, a recent paper that um, postdoc Lawrence Hawke has worked on uh, compared our global flood model estimates with um, basically the MODIS satellite record for a number of basins in Africa. Uh, and here we detect kind of instances of where the, the model over predicts the low return periods uh, quite frequently. Sometimes that's because of missing flood defenses. Um, uh, other times not. But actually, even when you start to account for this, um, we still see an overprediction. So if you go to the Congo Basin, where there are essentially no flood defences, we see pretty much the same pattern that we see in, in other locations. Um, further reason why these o o early models um, saw uh, uh, quite high estimates of exposure is that resolution and detail really, really do matter. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, Andrew Smith, published a paper on this a few years back, where we essentially looked at um, how changing the level of detail that you had in population exposure data and the resolution of the modeling um, impacted the, the, the exposure estimates that you made. And, and what we see here is that you know, the, the population data sets that were constrained um, to building locations, so the accurately placed people in buildings rather than rather than spread them out, really did make a quite profound difference to the risk estimates that we we're making. Um, similar thing can be seen by going from one kilometer to finer resolutions. Uh, you see a consistent drop in, in exposure as you refine the resolution and detail that are in the exposure data and the hazard data. Um, so that's another reason why these early models were perhaps quite insensitive. Um, uh, which we've made improvements on. Um, the fourth one, and perhaps the most obvious, is that the digital elevation data are often uh, rather smooth, um, and these can lead to, to rather smooth flood extents. So here we see actually an observation of in red of, of um, a flooding from Cyclone Idai. Uh, Boozy is roughly in the, in the middle of this uh, uh, floodplain here that I showed earlier. Um, and we see a, the one in 250 year return period flood hazard map 
uh, for the same location. So one of the things you see is that the, the, the data are quite a bit smoother than, than reality. Some of this will be because vegetation obstructs the uh, observation of water um, in the satellite image, which is from Sentinel-1 in this case. Um, but also we, we know that data sets like Merit are, are quite smooth. Um, so one of the things we've been doing about this is uh, trans, uh, 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 transitioning our flood model to use um, the new Copernicus stem that's recently been released. Um, and we've just finished some work removing vegetation and buildings from this stem. So this is a 30 meter digital elevation model. Um, and here we see simulations um, for a location in the central highlands of Vietnam uh, using this new tandem X dem versus uh, uh, Merit dem, which was what our, our global flood model was previously using. Uh, and you can see here the additional detail on the left that comes from the, the 30 meter data. You also start to see that, that we're resolving features like uh, relic channels um, and, and, and other kind of floodplain morphology that you might think would be important to flooding. Um, the key thing here, if you can, if you can just about make out the urban areas, is that they track the edge of the urban areas far better in this higher resolution dem than you do with the slightly smoother merit dem. Um, the paper about this has just been uh, submitted, so these data aren't quite out yet. But if you're interested in uh, in our tandem X dem from which we remove vegetation and buildings, uh, drop um, a postdoc Lawrence Hawker an email, and he'll be happy to to chat to you about the data that we've got. Um, but the last thing and, and the focus of what I want to talk about today um, is, uh, is that also we looked at the, the kind of actual setup of our global flood model um, and did it flood at the discharges that we think it did. And what we were discovering is that many places flood at slightly lower discharge than we were actually expecting that they would do. And, and to explain this properly, I need to tell you a bit, a bit about how our global flood model works. Um, so, um, so our global flood model is essentially um, is made up of a regional flood frequency analysis. This gives us the discharges um, in reaches of river around the world. And then for each of those uh, reaches, we have a hydrodynamic model, uh, list flood in this case, um, that is a, a, a regular gridded model, um, which includes a subgrid scale parameterization for the for the river channel. Some, sometimes super grid scale, but but usually subgrid scale. Um, and for this uh, model to work, we essentially need to estimate the depth of the channel um, and 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 simulate the water surface that we want to to be represented at bank full discharge. And so, in the global flood model results that I show here, the the assumption that the model is making is that the one in two year, the, the river discharge for the one in two year flow will, will, will sit at bank full uh, water surface elevation. Um, and we do this by using Manning's equation, or, or at least in this early version of the global flood model we, that, that we had a problem with, we were using Manning's equation for, for this analysis. So essentially, um, we pull out the bank heights for the channels, we pull out the widths that are all readily observable, we estimate the, the return period discharge for the one and two year flow, and then we calculate the channel depths um, from that using Manning's equation. The trouble is when we looked at uh, our river profiles in many parts of the world, what we would then see was if we actually ran the one in two year return period discharge through our global flood model, um, typically the water surfaces would start to exceed our bank for heights that we were expecting them to simulate. Um, so this was, uh, and, and this was a source of much overprediction at the lower return periods. Um, so what we've done is essentially implement a method where we, instead of using Manning's equation, or we've used Manning's equation to make a first guess, um, but then after that, we've then used a gradually varied flow solver to compute the actual water surface that would be simulated by our hydrodynamic model at, at that return period, um, assuming, uh, you know, um, assuming steady state flow. And then we apply, apply an optimization method to basically estimate the, the bed elevation for the channels um, that, would, that would give us our uh, water surface elevations um, or give us our bank heights um, at, the, at that one and two year discharge. So essentially we're correcting this bias that was in the model um, due to the use of Manning's equation. Uh, and uh, 
I'm conscious that I might be running a, a bit out of time. So just uh, quickly, these these are what that those results look like. So here's um, again uh, Mozambique, uh, where those cyclone Idai results came from, uh, the town of Beer at the bottom there. And we've simulated this uh, this tile using our two methods. One is our original model, uh, which is called the Manning's method in this case. So the black dots are basically the water surface elevation simulated for the one in two year flow uh, relative to the bank height. So relative to what we think the river bank elevation should be. Um, and then in green are the, uh, are the gradually road flow solver method applied over this entire tile. So um, to many thousands of river reaches. What we see is a dramatic decrease in, in, in the bias towards over prediction of the water surface elevation. And we can see that this happens across a range of uh, elevations uh, a range of discharges, um, a range of bank slopes, and a range of food numbers as well. Interestingly, we saw that, the, as you might expect, that the lowest or the biggest improvements in the model accuracy occurred where we had lower food numbers. Um, and, and this is demonstrated by this plot, um, which is a little bit complicated, but essentially we've got food number on the bottom and, and kinematic wave number uh, along the y-axis. So as you move up, uh, towards um, uh, the, the top right of this uh, diagram, you get into reaches that are kinematic, where, where largely the water surface uh, slope should match the bed slope, and then uh, into diffusive and, and full St. Venom style channels down below. And we saw in the Manning's model, the big bias in these kind of low gradient, low food number diffusive type locations. And the blue dots here are lakes, which we don't represent very well in our model. Um, and then in the gradually varied flow solver method, we see that there's a there's a substantial correction of those errors in those low low gradient food number uh, um, low food uh, locations uh, due to the use of the gradually varied flow method. Um, what does this mean for the model? Um, well, for the one in five year return period, we saw a roughly forty percent. Um, uh, greater flood extent due to the Mannings method. So this was the bias that was being introduced by this method into our model. Um, and the exposure went up from about, uh, the difference was from about 150,000 people in the Mannings model to 90,000 in the GFE uh, method. Um, uh, so so that, that saw, we saw a big decrease in, in basically the, the flood exposure estimates at our, at our lower return periods. Um, when we go to the higher return periods, so like the one in 100 year event, actually we see very little difference from, from what we're doing here. So this model becomes really insensitive to the, to the detail of the channel. Um, so we saw just a 5% change in the total volume on the floodplain and actually a decrease in the flood extent. Uh, so the opposite result and fairly similar estimates of, of population exposure. You get slightly more um, with the Manning's method. Uh, uh, sorry, slightly more with the exposure with the GFB method, despite uh, slightly less flood extents because um, uh, the flooding tended to occur a little bit further downstream in, in, those, in those channels because um, the water is retained in the channel for longer. Um, so thank you. I think I'll stop there and uh, just leave you with uh, some nice pictures of our, you know, the latest version of our global flood model applied in, in Vietnam on, on Copernicus stem. Uh, thank you very much.